In the olden days of past yore, Hans Trapp was a local man renowned for his greed and unscrupulousness. He would use witchcraft and deals with the devil to become wealthy. He was excommunicated from the Catholic Church, so he lost all his wealth and social standing. What do I do? Well, it's time for me to roam the countryside disguised as a scarecrow. Yes? Mm -hmm. And at some point, he became obsessed with the idea of tasting human flesh. <laughs> he lured a young shepherd boy in to his death and cooked him over a fire. This is Christmas, I want to remind you, this is a Christmas thing. Before he actually got to take the first bite, God struck him with lightning. But nope, you've gone too far, Hans. Oh, fair enough. You've gone too far. I like that God stepped in at this point. Oh, you killed him. Fine, you roasted him, fine. But the eating, Jesus. You gross monster. So he died. But of course, nowadays he appears at times on Christmas, going from door to door looking for tasty young children. Uh, what does he look like? A scarecrow. Some sort of human cannibal yeah, scarecrow not, yeah, thing. Yeah. With a lust for shepherd boy flesh. Horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> now you knew this about me already. I went to a religious high school. Anglican. Yeah. So pseudo so religious. It was more of a class based high school. Entirely. Yeah, not not just religion. We were the classiest. Like it's not like you went to Muslim school or Catholic school. They take it seriously. The Anglicans are like, this is just about the class system. How dare you, sir? This is about the actual Lord as defined by, what was it, Henry VIII? Anglican number one. Anglican number one. So the school calendar, what used to crack me up is the school calendar, it would come out this this little sort of folding cardboard pamphlet for each term and it would tell you what's going to happen for that term. Oh, he classes and stuff, yeah. But it was full of, and I only found this out today, Western Christian liturgical dates, time frames, and stuff. It wouldn't just say, oh, on January the 15th, we're doing this. It'd go like, during Advent, Epiphany, Michaelmas. Oh, yeah, okay. And yeah, my yeah. favorite was Septuagesima. I always thought Michaelmas was like your, your, your junior Christmas. Yeah. Like, it's like, that must be pretty good too. What do we get on Michaelmas? I want yeah. some. Uh... I want more or less. But yeah, it was always confusing. So I'd read, I'm like, I don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And it was, it was, it was full of them. Like, the calendars were full of all these labels. But basically, they're not well known beyond oh, the devout. Really? But you've heard of the 12 days of Christmas, right? Yep. This is, this no, is you get pheasants, you get partridges, you get, you get- It's not just a song that's annoying as fuck. It, there, there was a thing and it was part of the calendar. Oh, okay. Or it is. I didn't know this. I don't know if you knew this. So the song, of course, is the whole, you know, boasting about the true love gave me things. Yeah, okay. And it's basically birds or humans, except for five gold rings. Other than that, what it's are the other birds things? and humans. Turtle doves, French hens, calling birds, golden rings- Oh, that's not human. That's a ring. That's the only thing of 12. Yeah. Geese, swans. Lots of birds. Maids are milking. Oh, okay, we've got some slaves here. Okay. Ladies dancing. <laughs> lords are leaping. Oh, I'll take some lords. Pipers piping. Drummers drumming. And another fucking bird, of course, the damn partridge. Which we is, did pivot. We pivoted yeah. hard from birds to humans, didn't we? Yeah. It's just it's like bird, 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 golden ring, human, 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 and mm. always coming back to the partridge. That's just to close the loop. It does. And it's an, a long and annoying song. But, yeah, birds and people, birds and people, birds and people. They were obsessed in the olden days. So the 12 days actually refer to the period in Christian theology that marks the span between the birth of Christ and the coming of the Magi, apparently. Oh, is that what it is? I had okay. no idea. Yeah, yeah, fair I enough. I had no idea. I thought, they were, I thought they turned up on the night. Nope. I thought Mary pushed, put him in the manger, yeah. and they're like, cool, you got a, you got a no, cool baby here. popped out, mer guy, kept... Jesus, because no one knows what Mer is. 12 days, Mer, yeah. yeah. Like. Nah. The 12 days begin on the 25th and then oh. they run through to January the 6th, yeah, which yeah. is the epiphany. That's when you take your tree down. I thought that was New Year's Day. So, like, I don't really have a lot of devotion to Christian matters and I have no use for a lounge room full of birds. I don't have any idea what I do with 10 leaping lords. Like, I don't I need that stuff. I have a lot of ideas. I have a lot of ideas with 10 leaping lords. I suppose, are they at your beck and call? Oh, yeah, they are. You're all yeah. slaves. All the people in that sort of fucking slaves. <laughs> I got needs. Do my bidding. <laughs> but I'm still kind of aroused by, you know, it's Christmas, right? Yeah. As far as anyone listening to this is concerned. Uh-huh. And so stimulated by Christmas and, the and you know, I'm tempted, tempered by the true spirit of this fine podcast. Yeah. I'm going to give you our first holiday special, the 12 wholesome facts of Christmas. Welcome to The Wholesome Show. The podcast that believes there's always room for a big festive Yule log in the whole of science. True, we do. The best bit is when he reads it out before he processes it. Oh, I'm Will Grant. I'm not. Christmas Rod Lamberts. So this episode is going to be a grab bag. Four categories with three snippets each. Four categories, three snippets. The categories are food, celebratory delicacies. So these are all, all Christmas 
things. Christmas related. Uh, traditions, of course, wholesome ones. Yep. Christmas shortages. And of course, toys. And the way we're going to do this is I've given Will Santa's big red sack, as in a pile of little bits of paper. So Will's going to pick a, uh, a, a topic or a little thing, and then I'm going to give him the story. Shortage. Shortage. We start with shortages. Okay, we can do that. Norwegians fucking love butter. Who doesn't? Most Scandos do. And yep. yes, of course, I know you do as a, an English Australian and I as a partial Norwegian and everything else. Fucking love butter. But it wasn't great in uh, 2011 when there was a major butter shortage. Oh, no. There was a, in fact, the great Norwegian butter crisis of Christmas 2011. <laughs> So depending on who you believe, it kicked off in Sweden because there was a famous TV chef who urged everyone to use a lot more butter in their cooking and butter, butter, butter <laughs> recipes. <serious? laughs> this thing, his thing, his thing. We can predict the amount of butter, but not until a celebrity chef yeah. comes along. Butter, 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 butter. Butter demand went up. Shortages in Sweden soon spread. That's so cool. Yeah, and it started to migrate across borders. So everyone <laughs> blamed everyone else for the shortage, as you'd expect. So dairy farmers blamed Norway's largest dairy producer for not warning the country earlier that there'd be a demand for yeah, butter yeah, going yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The dairy producer said, no, it's the fucking weather. It went wrong. It's the weather, yeah. yeah. The cows didn't eat properly, therefore milk production was less. Many blamed the country's politicians for imposing high taxes on imported butter. Sure, okay. You fuckers, you've made butter more expensive. So soon my, uh, my Nordic brethren, they got a little crazy, as everyone in Norway imagined a Christmas without lussekat buns and Christmas biscuits. They love their... You know, buttery goodness. Buns and biscuits. Of course they do. Of course they do. So crowds would gather to stake out supermarkets. They would rush the supermarkets <laughs> before the shelves I, could even have butter put on I, them. I am not normally a person that stampedes the supermarket. But for butter? Um, but if there was a butter shortage, I would be uh, – It's because you're not stupid and butter's delicious. No, so I'd, be, I'd be calling in my contacts. I'd be like – You're butter people? I'm going, I'm going black market. I'm going. It's me. Yeah. It's butter boy. Yeah. Danish airports and on ferries going between Denmark and Norway, butter started being sold in the duty freeze, which it did not oh, before. Wow. Hundreds of ads appeared on the Swedish oxen site, Block It. Swedes started to offer to drive butter into Norway for up to 50 pounds a pack in 2011. I'll drive it to you. But like a pack, like a, a you know, like a like normal. Like a 250 or whatever. 250 yeah. gram. Yeah, yeah. 50 pounds. Yeah, 50 Whoa. pounds. Danish TV show organised a crowdfunding effort to give butter away to Norwegians. <laughs> It's like, like they're war-torn. Oh, my God. Um, a group of teenagers auctioned butter off to help fund their high school graduation <laughs> party, so it went off. <laughs> but my fave was, as a news report, two Swedes were arrested by Norwegian police officers for smuggling more than 250 kilos of butter in, <laughs> and they would sell them for more than 25 pounds a, 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 a snippet. That's beautiful. I know, I, right? I am so happy. I am so happy with that. There you go. There's a shortage. All Next. Right. Give me a give me a food. So there's a lot of um, interesting Christmas dishes. Here's one, the first of three. Mm-hmm. Holodets. Holodets. Holodet. He's Russian. Holodet. So holodet is a meat jelly. Meat jelly. And I mean already, I'm like, give me a meat jelly. So you cook pork parts, particularly the bits that contain a lot of bone, skin, and cartilage. Basically, the bits that have got the yeah. the goo goo. So legs, ears, hooves. Then you add yeah, chicken. You're not wasting your time with muscle. No. Then you add chicken to make a soup. Then you chill it into like a jelly, an aspic jelly goo oh, that goo. That's nice. Then the meat broth thickens and when it cools, it ends up in a lump of kind of jelly and you put things like this into it. So bits of egg. Uh, you, no, look, you look put I, a bit know, of I know into that it. food like that has gone out of favor in Australia. It doesn't look great. I'll eat it. I'll eat anything pretty much. And this is licorice because I'm not an idiot, but uh, it, it doesn't look great. Sorry, Russians. You're you're not an aesthetic people. Like ranking No, their ladies are very attractive. No, but I mean in terms of their design style. Like Yeah, they're like, they're dour. Sorry, but there, there are many countries that have uh, better aesthetic sensibilities. Right. And all I'm saying, if your food looks like that, there would be a way where your true food aesthetes could plate that up better. Yeah, and give it a name better than meat jelly. <laughs> I mean, it's not hard. <laughs> well, look, there you go. Branding and aesthetics. Exactly. Like, like, Branding like, matters. <laughs> Don't call it a dumb thing and make but, it look better. But, you know, it is a little bit Soviet in the sense that- It is can, a little bit Soviet. You know, you, know, you can go, this is this is a nice food in, in Soviet times. Like in, that was In Russia, this is very much delicacy. <laughs> this is- <laughs> Give me another one. Um, uh, what do you got, a toy? A toy. First toy. 
Hasbro Javelin Darts or <laughs> Lawn Darts, <laughs> a.k.a. Jarts or the Missile Game. <laughs> so these were sold as kids' toys from the 1960s as a, uh, a, quote, outdoor game for the family. Fuck yes. They were 30 centimetres long <laughs> and they were literally giant darts. <laughs> like literally. <laughs> what are we doing? Are we just throwing them at things? Yeah, you put a little circle on the lawn and then you stand oh elsewhere. Oh, my God. So between 1970 and 88, there was something like 6,000 plus ER visits related to this. <laughs> I like that you haven't said how many sold or anything like that. Let's just go straight to, no, how, straight many to e- how many, how many Sorry, ER, injuries. ER visits. There were deaths. Oh, geez. A, a couple of deaths. I'm not going to give you details because I know you get sensitive about children, but it's children. These things could pierce skulls. Let's leave it at that. And in one case, they definitely did. It's a Christmas miracle. Oh, my God. What a Christmas day that is. I know. What happened to Junior? Stabbed in the head with a giant dart. It's a toy. It's a game for the family. So since 1988, you could only get them with these big, giant, flat rubber heads, which is pretty much like still I, I throwing like a melt. I like they, they're like, no, the concept is great that we just got to siphon them up. That is so cool. How did you not think? No, maybe not. Because it says an outdoor game for the family. <laughs> I love I love that the 1980s happened. Mm. It's it's that era in modernity when they went, if you can, you should. It'll be fine. What's going to happen? Nothing. It'll be fine. <laughs> What's the worst that can happen? People aren't stupid. <laughs> no. You don't even have to be stupid, though. No. Like, that's literally- oh. No, you just have to be a child. Like, like oh. oops. All right, well. give me another food. Another food. All righty. Play on through the foods. Food number two, kiviak. Mm-hmm. It's from Greenland. Mm-hmm. And I love the opening quote that, I mean, there are a number of, there are many sources that talk about this, but my favourite is the beginning. Kivyak is relatively simple to make. First, collect four to 500 orcs, not orcs from Lord of the Rings, A-U-K-S. Okay. I don't want to collect four to 500 of anything. But four to 500 birds. Yeah. What are you doing? Then you stuff them, beaks, feathers and all, the whole body, into the hollowed out body cavity of a seal. Well, I love hollowing a seal. Standard recipe. <laughs> And stuff your four to 500 small water birds into it. It has to be the Alks. Next, you press out as much air as you can. I love old school cooking. You know, when, when we were much more yeah, cook, in tune with cooking. nature. The word cooking is doing a lot of heavy lifting here. <laughs> what, are we, what are we just leaving this in, a, in some dirt for a while? Can you see through this? <laughs> so you sew up the carcass hole and, and then you grease it and then you, you put it in a hole and you cover it with rocks for three to 18 months. <laughs> So the birds can ferment inside the seal. You have to use oh. oaks apparently because if you use other birds, they don't ferment as well, so you get botulism and stuff. You freaking gourmands, you. I know. Like, <laughs> I know. Mind you, you know, I love an aged thing. That's beautiful. Mm, let me remind you, it's the whole bird. And the whole seal. Well, the outside no, of the No, the seal. guts are taken out. It's torn, torn style from Star yeah. Wars. Whole bird with feathers? Yeah, everything. The whole bird. Yeah. The whole bird goes into the seal stomach, then three it's to 18 e- months. I get the four to 500. It's easier. It's basically flipping around. We're not counting here. We just fill a seal with bird. Yeah. And the layer of fat basically keeps it sealed, the seal sealed, and then they ferment. Everything ferments except for the feathers, and you can eat everything except for the feathers. Everything. That's fucking great. So apparently you eat it by biting the head off the bird and you can suck out the juice. It's pretty. When someone serves that up, you think, fuck yeah, give me whatever that is inside, whatever that is. I thought we'd be more scooping. I thought we'd be ripping the seal open and do it, sort of doing It'd a be scoop. Goo, yeah, like, like meat goo. goo. Mm. <sighs> Merry Christmas. We, we moderns are so weak. Mer- we, we are, we are, we are so are. weak yeah. compared to our ancients. I mean, fermenting, all good. <laughs> uh, okay, give me, give me a tradition. All right, a tradition. Hans Trupp. Hans Trupp. From Alsace Lorraine, so the edge of France. Yeah, or the edge of Germany, depending on what time of war it is. Fucking France, you racist. Of course it is, I know. Supremacist. In the olden days of past yore, Hans Trapp was a local man renowned for his greed and unscrupulousness. <laughs> he would use witchcraft and deals with the devil to become wealthy. Well, you don't use them to become poor. That's true. I want to cast a spell that makes me really destitute and horrible. <laughs> I want my life to be worse. I'll sell my soul so I can be homeless. I feel guilty. <laughs> Everything's shit. So he was excommunicated from the Catholic Church, so he lost all his wealth and social standing. Okay. So obviously he went, what do I do? Well, it's time for me to roam the countryside disguised as a scarecrow. Yes. Mm -hmm. And at some point during his journeys, he became obsessed with the idea of tasting human flesh. (laughs) 
So naturally, the next step is if you're obsessed with it, he lured a young shepherd boy in to his death and cooked him over a fire. This is Christmas. I want to remind you, this is a Christmas thing. Uh, no, no. Just give me a, is this a true story or is this like a- The next couple of sentences will- Confirm things. Clarify. Before he actually got to take the first bite of human shepherd boy flesh, God struck him with lightning. But nope, you've gone too far, Hans. Oh, fair enough. You've gone too far. I like that God stepped in at this point. Oh, you killed him. Fine. You roasted him. Fine. But you're going to bite- But the eating, Jesus. You gross monster. So he died. and um, But of course, nowadays he appears at times on Christmas going from door to door looking for tasty young children. Uh, what does he look like? A scarecrow. Sounds like a good costume to dress up as. If you saw that walking around, tapping at your window, so going, so, I some sort of babies. some sort of human cannibal yeah, scarecrow. Yeah, thing. yeah, exactly that, exactly that. Like any- with, with a with a lust for shepherd boy flesh. Horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give me give me a food. Another food. Can I just just for a second? Have just pause, all the pause for a second. Oh, yeah. I know I might have showed these before, but Rod Rod has crafting scissors, haven't I? And so he he cut them out like this. It is so beautiful. Lutefisk or lutefisk. There seems to be a pattern here. It's, yeah, it's your they, North, Northern Europeans. They really are. I mean, I had a big selection, but these are the winners for me. Shit you can do where it's cold and- And yeah. <laughs> it's described as <clears throat> gelatinous, smelly, and pretty nasty tasting, <laughs> unless you're really into it. It's made from aged stock fish or dried and salted white fish uh-huh. and yeah. lye. Lye. L- like, lye, lye like, like from the ground. Yeah, lye the caustic. Horrible yeah, yeah, substance. Like- yeah, that lie. I know. What does it do? Well, so you soak in cold water. You soak the fish, whatever it may be, for five or six days. Then you move it into a mix of cold water and lye for two days. This makes the fish swell. It gives oh. it a jelly-like consistency, which we all oh. look for in our fish. Oh. After this is done, the lye-saturated fish is basically caustic and inedible. Oh, okay. So what was the end goal here? Well, you soak it in cold water again for up to six days so you can – Basically, eat it. <laughs> so you could eat it before. We poisoned it and now we unpoison it. And we unpoison it. And my, f- my favourite bit of this, so this is that's the dish, that's the cooking, that's it. That's the goo and then you eat that. But what I love is um, when you cook and eat it, the fish and all the residue, they say, must be immediately removed from plates, cutlery and flying pans because if you leave it, it's impossible to get off. <laughs> it's like fucking Cochrane or something. I know we've talked about this fairly recently, but anything that destroys like crockery mm. or metal in the environment around you. Don't eat it. Don't, 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 don't put it in your body. Well, they say sterling silverware will be permanently corroded if it comes into contact with it. <laughs> so you've got to use stainless steel. I'd kind of be down to try it. I'd try it. Oh. I'd try most of this. The, the uh, yeah, I don't yeah, know, totally. the, the kiviak, the birds, I'm like, mm. no. I got no problem. I have zero problem with that. Give me a toy. Like, I'll give you a toy. Flubber. Flubber. So Flubber, you know, there was a, I think it was a Jerry Lewis movie and then it turned to Robin Williams movie, Flying Rubber, the mm. mad scientist who made some goo-goo. I saw the posters but never saw the movie. Obviously, toy company said let's make some for selling. Yeah. So it was a synthetic rubber, a mix of synthetic rubber and mineral oil, and it had, this is a quote, it had all the qualities one would want from a toy. Fun, unusual, inexpensive, and versatile. Uh, That's cool. pretty good. All right. It also gave the users, kids, sore throats, rashes, and other nasty reactions, <laughs> including one of the things I read said something about follicular damage or strange things going on with hair. So Hasbro made this again. By the time they decided to pull it off the shelves, more than 1,600 people had <laughs> connected ailments. And again, we're talking, <sighs> we're talking 60s here. <laughs> I just when do you stop? Like, 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 was when you finally Wait, get to fifteen ninety nine? Nah, fuck it, sixteen hundred. All righty, we've got, we, we have a case to answer. So they pulled it off the shelves, but then the company had a whole new problem. What do we do with all the leftover flubber? Obviously, we export it to poor countries. No, nah, not that. That's, just, that's just, you're a monster. So they couldn't bury it in the ocean because it floats, mm. and it was, <laughs> you couldn't burn it because you get this foul cloud of toxic yeah, black yeah, fumes. Yeah, yeah. So they went with the only other option in those days. You bury it. Yep. So sometime in the late 60s, apparently in the middle of the night, a bunch of Hasbro employees wandered into a field behind the factory and buried something like 50,000 balls of this stuff. And then they paved it over and made it into a parking lot. (laughs) And at least 35 years later or more, apparently locals say on hot summer days, not only can you smell it, (laughs) but it bubbles up through the pavement. (laughs) I want to go to the bubbling flubber site. Mm. 
We'll do a wholesome field trip. There's a great story. In 1983, Atari, you're not doing this one? No. They, they're like, E.T. was a huge movie and mm. they made a big video game. And they're like, it's going to be so fucking huge. And mm. so this is cartridge era. Mm -hmm. And so they made like a multi-millions of this thing and it was a fucking dog. Like it was it was a dog. It was the worst, worst game, game in the world. <laughs> and so they ended up with literally warehouses full of these cartridges that, that, that they couldn't What are we giving them away? We'll give and you so, food. And so they had to bury them in the desert. And it's, it's oh, like this sake. idea of this video game just being buried en masse. How bad is it? It's as bad as it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have to look at a way to get rid of it in a vaguely safe way. And, and like, deny that it ever existed. <laughs> what do you uh, got? Shortage. Oh, another shortage. Oh, these are good. The great Hawaiian toilet paper shortage of 1971. <laughs> International Longshore and Warehouse Union went on strike. Now, that, that means – Every dock on the West Coast got shut down. And just to confirm, uh, West Coast of America, mm -hmm. uh, Hawaii is an island. It very much is. Mm. So the residents, of course, in Hawaii completely dependent on shipments for things like salt, rice, etc. But the one that really stuck in everyone's memory was, of course, the lack of toilet paper. And we know this having come out of COVID, but shortage lasted for months and the quite – Months. By the time Christmas rolled around, Hawaii was a post-apocalyptic scene of people guarding their toilet paper supplies with their lives, which isn't exactly in the Christmas spirit. So it got bad. So July it started, and this was still going on. Wow, six months. Yeah. So a one bar owner, there's a few reports, but one bar owner says, oh, I remember how our patrons kept stealing rolls of toilet paper. So we moved them behind the bar, and we assigned a cook guy manager, poop manager, who would give each customer six squares. Six squares. When they went to the toilet. Great for pee, terrible for poo. Yeah, like, yeah, look, I, I get that that is, it, it solves some scenario. <laughs> but does not solve many. <laughs> New York Times 1971, they had an article that said um, the, the possession of toilet paper had become a status symbol. Oh, God. A wealthy heiress and her husband bought a condo in Waikiki and they, among some things, but many of the things I received as housewarming gifts from neighbours were rolls of toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> Radio stations would have contests and the winner would get toilet rolls and one of them delivered the toilet paper in a Rolls Royce. Wow. But you didn't get the car. You just got wow. the toilet paper. And it also got into the machinery of local politics. So there was a story about a grocery manager who was telling one of the newspapers, the Star Advertiser, he got a call from the mayor of Honolulu at the time and he said, I need a case of toilet paper and three bags of rice. And he says, all right, we'll work that out. And they handed it over at midnight in a car park outside his shop. And then the um, the mayor, uh, Frank Farsi, said, anything I can do for you? And, and the dude said, the manager said, oh, there's some potholes behind the store in the street there. And, and the next day they were paved over. So then, of course, it was getting crazy. So Nixon, the president, got involved with the dock workers and said, come on, back to work. And so they'd finally got back to work in late October, but the damage was already done. They went on strike again in 72, and they then finally resolved the problem in February of 72. So seven, eight months later – then toilet paper started to appear on the shelves again. So Christmas with – No toilet paper. No toilet paper and in a world where you can't just pop down and go, I'll get a different paper product because they had to be brought in by longshore folk oh as well. Oh, my God. Yeah, not good. Computer says no. Tradition. Hell yeah, I love the traditions. Krampus. Krampus. You haven't heard of Krampus? So Austria, Slovenia, Croatia, Northern Italy. This is a, um, a creature. So in many of these countries, St. Nick has a companion who's like his bad cop – counterpart. He has a bad cop? Yeah. Santa has a bad cop? At least one, but this is the one why, of the biggies. Why have we not brought that tradition in? I want Santa to have a bad cop. Yeah, who's the anti-Santa? Well, you, you know, the whole the whole premise is based on if you're good, you get the present. Yeah. If you're not good, you need a bad cop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I just, why don't we do that? I'm, I'm, I'm embracing that when one. When you hear more about them, maybe you'll change. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Krampus is a demonic half-goat monster, horns and a long tongue. The images of Krampus, are, there are too many, but look up Krampus, amazing. Horrifying-looking monster. Horrifying. Wonderful. He drags a chain behind him and rattles it as he walks. Nice. He carries a birch switch to whip children who are bad, but also <laughs> apparently in some cases a basket or a sack to kidnap them. Well, fine. Some stories say the ones he kidnaps he may drown or eat them or drag them to hell. <laughs> I don't know what I'm choosing here. Is this the anti-Santa you're looking for? Yeah. Um, and on the eve of St. Nicholas, which is the 5th of December, it's Krampusnacht, 
So lately it's become common for hordes of pissed fuckwits to get dressed up as Krampus, looking horrifying, and this cruise around Alpine towns Love it. breaking shit, but they break shit and they- Okay, don't everywhere. break shit, yeah. but you guys rule. I yeah. mean, I mean, dressing up as Krampus. Yeah, dressing up as an evil devil. So that's the December 5th, that Krampus knocked. And then on the 6th, which is St. Nikokos Day, so the guys, the adults, they're all men, of course, they're either, you know, hung over, arrested or beaten up because it gets ugly. The kids, however, they wake up to find out whether they got gifts or they have to nurse their injuries as a result of <laughs> Krampus's work. <laughs> That's the theory. And so in places like Austria, for example, some are suggesting maybe Krampus is a little bit too horrifying. Yeah, for right. No, that sounds Halloween to me. Give me a shortage. Tickle me Elmo. 1996. So Elmo, you know, the character from Disney, you, he's got that yeah, high yeah. pitch voice. He's well, very he's happy. He's Sesame Street. Yes, yeah, so that's right. Yeah, it's not Disney. He's a lovely guy, lovely yeah. character, blah, blah, blah. 1970s he appeared, but he wasn't really popular until the 80s. And when he became a thing, people went, oh, okay, we like Elmo. And then the doll came out. So you tickle a doll and it, it wiggles and jiggles and yep. squeaks and says funny things and giggles. Sales of the dolls in the 90s were strong, but they weren't. Mental. They weren't like, oh, okay. my fucking God, yeah, this yeah. is the biggest thing since anything. So no one had any reason to suspect in the late 90s that the mayhem that was about to kick off. I remember this. So apparently the doll appeared on the Rosie O'Donnell show. She was an actress. Slash comedian slash. Oh, she was in movies person. and stuff like she that. She was in movies. So apparently on her show she said her two-year-old son had an Elmo doll, but it's actually his second because he dropped the first one in the toilet, so he just fucked up. But Elmo, she says, has the innocence of a two-year-old. He wants to take love and give love with purity. So it's yeah, yeah, delightful. Yeah. That's Del- Elmo. Delightful. So this was allegedly instrumental in launching Elmo into the zeitgeist. So production went up, but it wasn't enough to ensure everyone who wanted one by Christmas got one. Yep. So parents went into a fucking frenzy. Like, it, it got insane. They'd descend on stores, they'd wait for deliveries, and they'd rush the employees, or as some sources put it, terrified employees, to get one. And one example I love, there are many, a Walmart worker guy called Robert. He was working the late shift. It was after midnight, December 14, and he apparently he was looking outside. There's 300 or more people waiting for a shipment of Elmo's. He picked one up and they fucking stampeded. They went off. They came charging at him. Seriously. He His injuries. He got a pulled hamstring, injuries to his back, jaw, and knee, a broken rib and a concussion. Whoa. And his quote was, I was pulled under, trampled. The crotch was yanked out of my brand new jeans. <laughs> What? what? How the fuck do you do that? I mean, everything else is scary, but actually to tear out the crotch of jeans? Well, that's where the, the Elmos are stored. That's where you keep them. Oh. Not not great. Not great. Parenting's tough. Toy? Give me a toy. <clears throat> Wego kite tubes. The what? The Wego or Vego kite tubes. Ring any bells? No, I don't have one. No, you wouldn't because <laughs> you don't have a speedboat. I kind of remember these. <laughs> They're big in the mid-2000s. Things that make speedboats more dangerous. Oh, Christ, infinitely, <laughs> infinitely. <laughs> so it's basically essentially a three-metre diameter blow-up disc. Yes. See, this sounds fun so far. You tie it to the back of a speedboat. Yeah, cool. And you fucking honk. Yeah, it sounds awesome. Very quickly it gets airborne. <laughs> Conservatively, depending on the length of your tether, it will go to four or five metres. Okay. Moving at speedboat velocities. Landing, let's call it willy-nilly. Yeah, 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 yeah. You stop the boat and it might just keep going somewhere. Well, it's not aerodynamic. So if you're honking along four or five metres oh, in the air, yeah. it flicks slightly. You're yeah. strapped in. <laughs> you're holding two little handles. <laughs> oh, is it staying uh, – you're staying right way up? It's not just – Not necessarily. <laughs> no, not necessarily at all. This is not a stable device. <laughs> You know what this says is the world of toy possibilities is vastly, vastly it's, bigger than the world of safe toy possibilities. Oh, beyond. Like, like, beyond. Like, so very quickly after they got it, reports were coming in of riders losing consciousness, breaking vertebra, rupturing eardrums and puncturing lungs because you'd go up, you'd flip, and you hit the water. <laughs> you hit the water fucking hard. I'll bet you do. So by July 2006, at least in the US – 84 plus serious injuries and three deaths. So Consumer Product Safety Commission and the company Wego recalled all the kite tubes and it very quickly became illegal to use them in basically any body of water, at least in the US and Canada. I fucking love to have a go though. It'd be freaking wild. It'd be great until you were horribly injured. Well, this is your, third the final, your tradition. The final. Oh, that's a nice one to end on. Grilla, her sons and the Yule Cat from Iceland. <laughs> so Grilla is a giant ogre and she lives in a cave. Cool. 
she emerges at Christmas to hunt for children. Yes. Who she kidnaps, takes to her cave, no. and cooks them in a stew. Well. There is a fuckload of child cannibalism in the north. I, I just don't know what it I, is. I feel like it's- And Christmas related. Maybe that's the thing that kids are most scared of, being cooked and eaten. So she has 13 troll sons who are also called the Yule Lads, yeah. <laughs> which is a punk band for sure. We're the Yule Lads. No, it'd be great. Fuck you. And they, they come out one at a time starting on December the 12th. And there's heaps of them. I won't tell you all of them, but like there's one called, the name translates as Spoon Licker. He licks spoons. Pot Licker. He licks pots. He steals unwashed pots so he can lick them clean. Bowl Licker. <laughs> there's a lot of licking going on There's a lot of licking going on. This is on. a weird Icelandic thing. Yeah. <laughs> then there's uh, on the 20th of December, Sausage Swiper. Is this like a guy that's made up by some dad who's like he eats the sausages for lunch and he's like, oh, hide your sausage, like sorry, it was the sausage liquor. That son, hide your sausage. <laughs> it gets worse. 21st of December you get the window peeper. Okay. And <laughs> this one, 22nd of December, gut der Pefur, door sniffer. <laughs> door sniffer. He sniffs doorways in pursuit of baked goods. Who mm. doesn't? Okay. Who doesn't? Baked goods. <laughs> so that's her children. She also has the cat, the Yola Kutsudin or Yule cat. Now you'd be amazed here. It's not a sweet little kitty you put on your lap and pat. It's about lion sized. Oh. Uh-huh. Black and angry. It, quote, lopes through town in the dark, peering into the lighted windows of children's bedrooms. The only way to save yourself from being eaten by the cat is to show that you got clothes for Christmas because if you get clothes, that means you're good. What? I know. New you get clothes. the socks and undies and you're fine. Yeah, you put them out and go, these are new look, clothes. I was look, given new clothes, I'm I got good. My, yeah. But if you don't get new clothes, you leave out old clothes and hope that they look new enough that the cat won't eat you. <laughs> Fuck yeah, Iceland. <laughs> Here's my old undies. I've washed them. <laughs> don't kill me. There you go. That's the uh, 12 facts of Christmas. There are so many more I could have told you about. I didn't. And, um, you know, happy birthday, Jesus, to everyone. Yeah, yeah, like merry holidays and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. We, we don't we yeah. don't come into your earballs in the holidays in this way. You know, if you're eating your Yule log, drinking your eggnog. Waving your new clothes so you don't get eaten by an ogre's cat. Just remember that we support whatever... Ogre you're into? Whatever ogre you're into and science. And science. And science.